In this episode, in the final days of 2021, we go back and do a wrap-up of our Thousand Island Cruise. Welcome aboard. Hey everybody, and welcome to the final days of 2021. Today is December the 28th, and well, the boats have been out of the water for a couple of months. The marina is a cold, desolate, windswept place. And for those of us who boat, it's only about four to five months before our boats will go back in the water, uh, barring increased uh, global pandemic, supply chain issues, or anything like that. But here's hoping for next year. In the last video, I talked briefly about doing sort of a best of, like some key takeaways from our 2021 cruise. Now that was a few months ago back in September, but I think it's really important to record the things you've learned. You know, you either write them down or, or do a video. Because my fear is that if we don't record it and remember it, then if you're like me, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. So Jacqueline and I put together uh, a quick list of just some of the main things that stuck up in our mind and I wanted to share those with you today. Now as always if you like what you see click the like button hit the subscribe and tell your friends and leave us some comments because we always love to hear from you. So here we go in no particular order the key takeaways of the 2021 Thousand Island Cruise. Number one the first point is that we were outside of our comfort zone and I will start by saying we are still new boaters and I would still say we're inexperienced. We only bought our first boat back in 2018. I think we had one month out of that season because I bought so late. 2019, bit of a delay. 2020, delay. This year, delay. So we've never actually had a full season. So. There were times we wouldn't go out because of wind or waves or weather conditions that other more experienced boaters might have. If anything, we were overly cautious. And that's still okay too. But the day we left the marina, it was fairly windy. And when we finally turned around the, uh, the corner towards starboard and made our way towards Gananoque, we were right into the wind and right into the waves. And it was a little bouncy. It was certainly outside of Chloe's comfort zone. But those were good lessons. And again, from our cruise, uh, the first day when we were at Aubrey Island, it was raining and I was wrestling with the decision, do we go to the next destination or do we stay? Do we go when it's raining? All of that. And in one sense, we were pushed a little bit outside of our comfort zone, but I think that's really valuable because it's the only way you really expand what that area of comfort is. You push a little bit, get more confident it's not as scary as you might think it is or as it might appear and then you push a little bit more and a little bit more and being out in the open water was never the main concern for us in terms of um, in terms of the comfort zone in terms of weather it was always docking or leaving the dock where the heart rate goes up a little bit and a little bit of sweat goes on and sometimes some bad words but overall, I think we did extremely well with all of that. But it's important to do, because how else do you learn except by occasionally being a bit uncomfortable? Part two is communication. Now, there are a couple of parts to that. One is that over the course of the week, Jacqueline and I communicated more effectively and more easily every single day. Because every day, we were leaving a dock, going over open water, going to another dock, and having to communicate about literally everything. Shoals nearby, water depth. She spends a lot of time checking ahead of, you know, what's up next? Or do I need to turn to port or starboard? Or is there a shoal? And there are a number of those in the Thousand Islands. I tended to focus on sort of the near area uh, and relying on her navigation skills on where I'd go, you know, in the next 500 meters or 1,000 meters. Part of the communication was important because quite often, especially when we're docking or leaving the dock, I can't see where Jacqueline is from the flybridge. So effective communication is also incredibly safe. I need to know 
where she is and what she's doing, whether she stepped up, stepped off the boat onto a dock or if she's got a line stuck or something. More importantly, at one point, um, we were coming into a dock and she said, what are you thinking? Well, what do you mean? What am I thinking? I'm thinking. Then I realized, oh no, I have to be telling her what I'm planning to do with the boat because she's over on the side and what I do and what I'm planning might determine if she's going to step off at a certain point or if she's going to try and lasso a cleat or if she's going to hand off a line to a dock hand. All of this is important. To me, it seemed really mundane to say things like, I'm putting the right shifter forward and I'm easing off on the throttle a bit, but she needed to hear that in order to make her next move. So all became very, very effective. With communication comes trust. And once you can trust each other to be more confident in what they're doing and know where they are and what they're doing, the, the whole experience just becomes more enjoyable and a lot less stressful. We've got some very simple words and drills that we run through. So, so far we haven't had to buy what they call the marriage savers, the microphone headsets, but you never know in a strong wind, something like that might be useful. The third part, confidence and competence or proficiency, whichever you prefer. I think they both go together you know, like peas and carrots, like a Reese's peanut butter cup, like something. But if you're confident, you tend to eventually gain more competence. And once you're more competent at something, it makes you more confident. So it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship as I see it. What I found is the cruise was an excellent six day training opportunity because every day we were doing something. We were running through starting the engines. We were going through our startup drills, doing things with the lines, leaving the dock, cruising, coming into a dock. You know, the, the shutdown procedure for the engines and everything else. We had to go through that every day. That was really important. And as every day went by, I felt that the boat handled better. Well, the boat handled exactly the same. It was me that was different. By the end, I really felt I could make that boat dance. I could turn it on a dime. I knew I could bring it in to a dock, even with higher winds and waves and maybe adverse current. But I felt confident that I'd be able to bring it in safely with no damage, no injuries to anybody. And that was a great feeling because with that, you enjoy cruising that much more, knowing that you're driving the boat, the boat's not driving you. Another point is just the location. To be able to cruise in the absolutely stunning Thousand Islands was just a treat. I don't think it's as well recognized as it should be. It's pristine, natural beauty, wonderfully maintained, great facilities. I, I just can't say enough good things about it. And throughout the videos, I talk about how clean everything is, the composting toilets, everything else. And you're not really paying that much for the privilege of cruising through this natural beauty. Normally, we had only been in a very, very small area in the area of Ivy Lee. We'd gone to Endymion Island. That was the first time with the shakedown cruise when our daughter was here from Alberta and up to West Grenadier. But that had been about it. So this forced us farther to the west than we'd been before. So the islands around Gananoque and then going all the way over to Kingston, which wasn't unfamiliar territory. I mean, we live here for gosh sakes. But to get into the Confederation Basin and experience that from a different point of view was absolutely valuable. There are wonderful marinas and great areas around, and there's just too much to explore in one week. But I think we did a good job. With that comes that sense of history. There's Fort Henry in Kingston. There are the Martello Towers that are part of the defenses from the 18th, 18th and 19th century. But long before that, the indigenous peoples farmed, fished, hunted in exactly the places we were. And one of the things Jacqueline and I were very keen and keenly aware of is that we were literally walking in the footsteps of history. That thousands of years ago, somebody could have been walking on that same outcrop looking to fish or to hunt deer. That's vitally important to remember because 
the relationship in Canada between the colonists, French or English or other, and the indigenous peoples is complicated. And in many cases, it's not a history that many of us should be proud of. September the 30th was the first official day of national truth and reconciliation. And this is a day that acknowledges the very difficult and troubled relationship between the colonists and the indigenous peoples of this country, and especially with the residential school system. That day occurred when we were on Camelot Island. And Jacqueline and I spent a lot of time thinking about our history, contemplating how we've treated other peoples, and what would make a relationship work. It's complicated. I certainly don't have the answers, but what's important, I think, is to reflect on this. And that was the perfect place for us to sit and think about the history of this country. Another point is a buddy boat. We hadn't really thought about it. And as we were within about a week of our trip and telling friends at the marina, oh, we're going to go out for a week and do this and island hop. Some people were saying, geez, I wish I'd known I, we could have gone with you. Or if we had planned our vacation time, we could have done a couple of days with you. And, and I think what we realized is we missed an opportunity to share this opportunity with some friends. The other factor is one of safety. If something was to happen at an island and at that point in the year, there were two times we had islands entirely to ourselves. Having an extra boat and a couple of people there is important in case there are mechanical issues or if there's a health and safety concern. It's nice just to have a couple of other people around to make sure you're okay. That's something we'll do next year. Not sure exactly what that's going to look like yet, but it's on our plan. And it's fun. We share some meals, do some meal planning, have a few adult beverages together and, and learn from each other. And that's half the fun of boating. It's a very social activity. Some of the not so positive things we learned on the cruise, one was power management. Now I have a solar kit, don't get me wrong. It's just that it's not on the boat. It's not assembled and it's currently sitting in my basement. Jacqueline bought me the solar panels and the, uh, the charger for my birthday, but was thinking that the install would be a lot more simple than it actually was going to be. Um, I didn't have all the fittings and the hardware and we hadn't wired it through. There's, it was just complicated. So the panels stayed at home and we went out on the water and I don't have any gauges that really measure effectively my, my voltage. So I was always worried about batteries. Are we going to run out of batteries? The biggest draw on batteries is the refrigerator. So always very conscious about the water pump going off or flushing the heads or, or anything like that, because I was worried about, you know, having enough battery power. That being said, I do have two batteries wired up to be the house battery and an isolated battery to be completely separate as a starter battery. So I wasn't too worried about the engines never kicking over, but it was something I didn't like to worry about. And we're also really careful. We have battery powered lanterns and flashlights and, and all sorts of things, but wondering if your batteries are going to hold up is not a good feeling to be. And, and frankly, I don't know if we could have done two or three nights at an island without really having had to do something to charge up the batteries, either go out for a while, run the engines, something like that. We do have a generator. Uh, the generator doesn't work. It's never been serviced. So next year, lesson learned. So the solar panels will be mounted on the top above the aft cockpit. We'll have the generator serviced as well for some extra redundancy. And then I don't have to worry about it. And there is something to be said for peace of mind. Similar to that was fuel management. Um, the fuel gauges, well, were notoriously inaccurate. In fact, they're completely inaccurate because they really didn't read anything at all. Now, if you remember, the starboard fuel tank uh, doesn't have any fuel in it. It's just got water as ballast. So everything was running off the port tank, which is 110 gallons. Now, both engines were running off of that. Well, that's great, but that gauge didn't really work. When it was full, it would read sometimes a quarter, sometimes a little more. So I was estimating it based off running my Crusader engines at, I don't know, 1,800, 2,000 RPM, so many hours, so much fuel, so many gallons per hour. And I 
sort of back of the envelope it from there. But I was starting to get a little worried because our first two days were going into the wind and into the current, so the engines are working a little bit harder. And what was the consumption like? As it turned out, the consumption was pretty much what I had expected. Um, and you can see in the video where I fueled up again at Portsmouth Harbor, um, just to make sure we had enough to, to get us back home. And we did. But again, having to worry about that isn't the most pleasant. Would I replace the, uh, the gauges? Yeah, actually. Replace them with something good or at some point put in digital just to not have to worry about things. Very similar to the batteries. And finally, it's a short list, but again, probably the most important is just the sheer joy of exploration. The Thousand Islands is the perfect location, and we had an entire week. We had a rough schedule, but we didn't have to be anywhere at any particular point or any particular time, and we could just do what we wanted and come and go as we pleased. And that was so exciting for us because that's what it's all about. Part of it was relaxing, part of it was certainly learning, but the other biggest part was just enjoying the beauty and the surroundings that we had. And again, pushing our boundaries, getting a little more confident each day and, and just having fun. And I don't think people, especially in the last couple of years, always have the ability to just have fun and relax and truly let go of a whole bunch of stress in the world. And we were privileged to be able to do that, which reinforces that we're going to do it again next year. So that, in a nutshell, is the 2021 cruise. If you have any questions, please send us some comments and some emails and happy to answer them. And if you have stories of your own, I would absolutely love to hear them. Take care and all the best for 2022. Hey everybody, if you like what you saw, hit the like button, click subscribe, tell your friends, and we wish you all the best for a happy and healthy new year.